Okay, so the revolution in France um, succeeded in toppling the French monarchy and in that sense was the most successful of the revolutions in Europe in 1848. Although, as we saw by the end, it had um, veered back to a more maybe moderate or maybe even conservative um, form of government, albeit still remaining a republic, but a republic controlled by conservative forces. In an earlier lecture, I gave you guys a quote from Clemens von Metternich. Uh, von Metternich was the Austrian foreign minister for most of the first half of the 19th century. He was also probably the person most singularly responsible for the coalition of conservative monarchies in Europe, that is the, the, the working together of conservative monarchies to defeat liberalism uh, as it arose in the various corners of Europe. Um, von Metternich's quote that I gave to you was that when France sneezes, all of Europe catches a cold. And that was very true of 1848, that the rebellion that began in France in February of that year uh, spread to the rest of Europe. Um, and indeed, it spread to uh, Metternich's own Austria as well. Um, and actually, the pattern of the beginning is very similar to what happened in France, that student demonstrations uh, in Vienna in March, um, inspired in many ways by the example of what happened in France, um, led to a confrontation with police. Police opened fire, uh, they killed several demonstrators, and this led to, led to a surge of anger and outrage, and in response, the government was forced to give in uh, some concessions. Um, indeed, von Metternich himself said, and if I can quote him here, uh, so von Metternich was uh, 75 years old at this stage, so at the end of his career, and he said, in response to these student demonstrations, I am not a prophet, and I do not know what will happen, but I am an old physician, and can distinguish between temporary and fatal diseases. We now face one of the latter. So in other words, Metternich was seeing these kind of liberal student protests in Vienna as uh, a real threat to the existence of the Austrian monarchy, not simply a passing phase. Um, and he very much re represented conservative order in Austria. Um, and so one of the measures that Ferdinand I, the Austrian emperor, took in order to calm the, the angry mob in Vienna was to fire Metternich. So Metternich was sent off into exile um, in London. He, could, he, gave, he granted some other concessions as well. Uh, he allowed the creation of a national guard amongst the, the working class people of Vienna. This was something that had happened in France as well. Basically, it was supposed to be a concession that allowed the working classes to feel free that they could form militias and defend themselves against government suppression. Um, he created workshops. He allowed workshops to be established in Vienna, uh, just like we saw in Paris. And he also agreed to um, uh, create a, a parliament that was elected by universal suffrage. Uh, so Austria, in many ways, is now, at least based on the concessions of March 1848, on the road to becoming a constitutional monarchy. Um, something kind of even more radical than the constitutional monarchy that had existed in France prior to um, 18, 1848, in the sense that uh, it had universal suffrage. However, Ferdinand was trying to stall for time. He did not really want to give in these concessions at all. He was simply trying to find a way to buy time in order to preserve his hold on power. So in the summer of 1848, he had announced a new concession. Essentially announced the end of serfdom, or more specifically, um, the requirement upon peasants in Austria and in the Austrian Empire that they had to give a certain amount of days of service of labor every year. So for example, if you were a peasant landowner in Austria, you might owe 100 days of labor to your um, or to the noble living in the area, even if you owned your own plot of land. The name for this service was actually the robot. Robot. Uh, th that's where our modern word robot for um, what we call robots comes from, from from the uh, term of service for for peasants in the Austrian Empire. But what Ferdinand was doing in in conceding this concession was trying to find a way to fragment the various forces opposed to him. Because in Austria, um, we have, who, who, so who, who are the people who have an issue with the Austrian government? Liberals um, who want a greater say in political power, working classes who want jobs, um, and often then times the poor peasants in the countryside. So what Ferdinand is doing is by giving or ending uh, serfdom, ending the robot, 
um, he is hoping that the peasants will no longer support the liberals and the working class. So he's trying to break up the kind of alliance of these different groups to um, allow him to defeat each one individually. But Ferdinand's ability to actually stamp out these rebellions is hindered by the fact that across the Austrian Empire there are various rebellions taking place. Um, in a few minutes I'll talk a little bit more about the nationalist dimension of the revolutions in Austria. But that's actually a big difference between the revolution in Austria and the revolution in France in 1848 that not only does do Austrians have liberals, working class and peasants demanding change, that's very similar to France, but a fourth element which did not exist in France was the various nationalist groups. France was a nation state, largely. Austria was an empire made up of lots of different nationalities, and some of those nationalities uh, were demanding independence or at least a greater deal of political autonomy from Austria. So at the same time that Ferdinand is trying to deal with the liberals and the working class of Austria, he's also trying to stop nationalist rebellions in Italy, in Hungary, and Bohemia. Bohemia being modern, uh, largely based in modern Czech Republic. So it takes time for Ferdinand to kind of try and put out all these fires before he can return to dealing with the crisis in uh, Austria itself. Um, in August of uh, 1848, Ferdinand, who had kind of fled Austria or fled Vienna for a couple of months, returns to Vienna. He then closes national workshops. Um, and this produces a lot of anger that eventually leads, leads to a new worker rebellion in October 1848. That is, the workers of Vienna start seizing controls of cities, start establishing barricades, um, and in response, the army is sent in. Uh, the army bombards Vienna with artillery and kills 3,000 people. Um, and in, in many ways, this is a very clear echo of the June days in France. Um, that is, the working classes, in response to the workshops being closed, uh, rebel and are defeated uh, with very strong military force. And that largely defeat, defeated the working class and liberal uh, reforms um, in uh, Vienna. The, 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 the kind of threat of violence, the potential threat of overthrow no longer exists for Ferdinand. However, he doesn't really remain as uh, emperor for much longer. Um, it's basically felt that Austria would do with a new king with a better start. Uh, so Ferdinand abdicated the throne in December 1848 and was replaced by his uh, nephew Franz Joseph. And Franz Joseph is going to go on to rule Austria for a long time. So starting in December 1848, he's going to rule until 1916, until the middle of the First World War. Meanwhile, the Austrian parliament remained in existence into early 1849. The Parliament was supposed to be working on a constitution, but in March 1849, um, Franz Joseph had the Parliament shut down. And so the workers were defeated by military force um, in October of 1848, and then the Liberals essentially were, without the kind of support of the working class and the threat of violence they brought, were simply unable to stop um, Franz Joseph from shutting down the parliament in 1840, March 1849. I mentioned, however, that there were nationalist revolts in other parts of Austria. The most obvious place where we see national revolution is in Hungary. So in March 1848, Hungarian liberals um, essentially declare they are going to become politically autonomous. They're demanding various political reforms, and they basically tell, at this time, Ferdinand, who was the emperor, that, okay, you can remain as king of Hungary, but from going forward, Hungary is going to have its own parliament. It's going to make a lot of its own internal laws. It's going to have its own foreign policy, and it's going to have its own army. Um, and in addition, they're going to introduce political reforms like press freedom, uh, taxing nobles, um, and what's called magyarization. So magyarization basically refers to um, the su support, institutional support for the Hungarian language. All aspects of this new politically autonomous Hungary of its government are going to function through Hungarian. And so that kind of shows the tension of nationalism within the Austrian Empire that the Austrian or the Hungarians don't like uh, essentially being governed by German speakers. Uh, they insist that they're now going to be governed through their own language, which is Hungarian. But of course, Hungary is also made up of a variety of different nationalities. So they're rejecting German uh, nationalism, but they're also imposing Hungarian language on groups who don't speak Hungarian themselves. So for about a year, 
the Austrian uh, emperor really has to kind of allow Hungary to retain this political autonomy. It can't do an awful lot about it because it's dealing with so much crisis elsewhere. Um, in 18, April 1849, this crisis in Hungary comes to a head. Basically, the Hungarian parliament refuses to recognize uh, Franz Joseph as the new emperor. Um, in response, Franz Joseph sends an army in to close the Hungarian parliament. The Hungarians announce their independence. They issue a declaration of independence. The Hungarian declaration for independence is actually on the list of primary sources on Blackboard. And you'll see in many ways it was very clearly modeled on the American declaration of independence. The Hungarians defeat the Austrians a couple of times. And it looks like they might succeed in actually breaking away from Austrian control and creating an independent country. But the Austrians look for political support from Russia. Russia is still governed by Nicholas I, who we came across in an earlier lecture when we talked about the Decemberist revolt in Russia in 1826. He is very conservative and he is very, very happy to or willing to send in Russian troops, I think 140,000 Russian troops, uh, march into Budapest, the capital of Hungary, and crush the Hungarian uprising. So. The nationalist element in, in Austria uh, plays a role in the revolutions of 1848, but the Hungarians ultimately are defeated uh, in 1849. The one other place we see, or the, the most obvious example of a nationalist rebellion, is actually in Bohemia. That Czechs in Bohemia, uh, along the same lines, have some similar demands to the Hungarians. In fact, what they specifically demand is that they be allowed to create a political, politically autonomous territory like Hungary, in which the Czech language will be used for government, in which Czech speakers will have an advantage. Um, so they're looking for political autonomy and some of the more traditional liberal reforms, that is a wider franchise, a constitution, um, freedom of the press. And so they're, they're essentially echoing the demands of the Hungarians. Um, however, they are the defeated. The Austrian army in the summer of 1848 is able to suppress this Czech rebellion as well. And they are very eagerly helped um, by local Germans. So Bohemia has a Czech-speaking majority. It also has a large German-speaking population. And so these Germans see this effort to promote the Czech language, Czech autonomy, as a threat to their interests. And they are quite happy to help suppress uh, the revolution in Bohemia. And so long story short, in Austria, there are various efforts to create working class reforms, liberal reforms, and nationalist reforms as part of the revolution. But ultimately, the Austrian monarchy is able to suppress and defeat all of these measures by the spring of 1849, albeit with Russian help.